Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. Just turn all the way over here to see everyone. Um, so thank you all for coming and joining us tonight, or today, it's not night yet. Um, as we gather today, we're all on indigenous lands. Those of us at the Museum of the White Mountains are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abnaki, Penacook, and Wabnaki peoples. We're grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you joining us from home, I encourage you to learn more about the indigenous presence in your area, both past and present. We put a link in the chat where you can learn more about the indigenous histories of your place at native-land.ca as well as the Abnaki peoples of Northern New England through the Musée des Abnaki in Quebec. As you may already know, as part of my research for our summer exhibition, I've been learning about efforts to preserve the culturally important brown ash tree, which is under threat from the emerald ash borer. So save the date for May 31st at 4 p.m. so you can join us for the opening reception of a Baskets and Borers. At our March 7th NEH Spotlight on Humanities and Sustainability Studies lecture, we learned about the important work being done by the Ash Protection Collaboration Across Webnacic Project at UMaine. If you missed that talk, I encourage you to watch it on our YouTube channel to learn more about the indigenous-led research they are doing on the culturally important brown ash tree. For our final event of the semester in our series, which is supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, we're joined by Michelle Neely. Neely is Associate Professor of English, Director of American Studies, and Affiliated Faculty in Environmental Studies at Connecticut College, which already give you a sense of why she's a great fit for the speaker series. Her talk today will draw on the work of Henry David Thoreau, Willa Cather, and Robin Wall Kimmerer to explore the connections between attention, affection, and ecological care for a specific environment. And at the end of the event, for those of you in person, um, there'll be someone from the bookstore upstairs selling copies of her book as well. So please join me in welcoming Michelle. Okay, so um, this is um, new work where I've just found myself in all kinds of ways thinking about place and thinking about settler colonialism um, and thinking about the way that um, I got asked to write something about Henry David Thoreau, who I've written about a lot. Um, and I realized that the thing that I really wanted to think about was um, the fact that he talks about indigenous people all the time and his kind of like relationship to um, the first inhabitants of where he lived all the time. But I feel that a lot of the scholarly work doesn't deal as much with that aspect of his work. And I wanted to think about that. What is the, what is the kind of like investment in um, not thinking about or taking him to mean what he says, not working with um, this aspect of him as much as um, I think we could for a writer who's been written about like seven ways from Sunday. This seemed really interesting to me. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of what, then I found myself thinking about um, it in relation to Willa Cather, um, a slightly later writer. Um, so I'm going to talk about her O Pioneers, which is about 50 years after Thoreau, um, and kind of like what would happen if I put them into conversation with um, this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, with, which um, many of you may have read. Um, and um, yeah, so this is a kind of attempt to put these pieces together, just some thoughts about place and love and responsibility and relationships of care. Okay, so part one, Thoreau, a bunch of violets without their roots. The first piece of this talk came from a desire to think about three sentences from an essay that Thoreau wrote near the end of his life called Chess and Cook. Um, he wrote it about this 1853 trip he took to Maine, and the essay was first published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1858, and then after his death, um, some essays that he wrote about this trip were collected into the book that we now know as the Maine Woods. Okay, so here's the passage. What a coarse and imperfect use Indians and hunters make of nature. No wonder that the race is so soon exterminated. I already and for weeks afterward felt my nature the coarser for this part of my woodland experience and was reminded that our life should be lived as tenderly and daintily as one would pluck a flower. 
The reason this passage has interested me for quite a long time now is because in certain ways it feels out of step with the Thoreau that we most of the time read, that we think about, that we talk about, that we write about. Um, the Thoreau who gave all of these public lectures um, decrying you know, slavery in the United States, who several times actually aided fugitive people traveling on the Underground Railroad. Um, the Thoreau who was unafraid to criticize almost any aspect of his society that tended to exploit people or non-human nature to make a buck. In this passage, by contrast, the kind of blunt bluntness of the settler colonialism, the naked endorsement of an extermination that is rendered um, inevitable, certain, so the no wonder, no wonder, um, and then all but accomplished, right, so soon exterminated past tense, was really striking to me. This passage appears in an essay whose other main human characters are Thoreau's two Penobscot guides. So the word exterminated is manifestly false. It's an instance of what John O'Brien has called firsting and lasting, meaning the wishful tendency of white 19th century New Englanders to cast indigenous peoples who lived alongside and among them as inevitably doomed, the last of their kind, um, despite observable evidence of indigenous resilience and survival, right? So he's on this trip, um, he's hanging out the entire time with his two Penobscot guides, but like he's talking about their um, the extermination of their people and indeed all indigenous peoples as like basically already happening, already accomplished. <laughs> Equally striking is the stark contrast between this passage and one that appears shortly after it. This passage about coarse and imperfect uses of nature sets up a multi-paragraph um, screed against logging that rails against the commodification of non-human life, the conversion of live pines into dead boards. The second passage um, culminates with the words, it is not the pine, I think I have this, yeah. It is not their bones, he's talking about pine trees. It is not their bones or hide or tallow that I love most. It is the living spirit of the tree not its spirit of turpentine, with which I sympathize and which heals my cuts. It is as immortal as I am and perchance will go to as high a heaven, there to tower above me still. This last sentence is possibly the most famous in the entire essay because it was deemed so transgressive in its time, right? It was considered to be blasphemous to say that a pine tree was gonna go to heaven. Um, it was considered to be so transgressive um, that it was censored from the original publication of this essay in the Atlantic Monthly, much to Thoreau's consternation. So he wrote an extremely angry letter to the, to the editor, James Russell Lowell, um, calling its omission a mean and cowardly act. To put these two passages side by side, the passage where Thoreau reflects on the supposed inevitability of the extermination of native peoples and the passage where he speculates about the immort immortality of the pines is to beg a question of the relationship between them. We might notice that only one of these passages was deemed too indecorous, too philosophically violent to print, and it wasn't the one casually accepting genocide. We might also notice that both passages are making claims about the best and worst ways of using non-human nature. In the first, sustenance use relationships are alighted with um, utilitarian commodification, right? So using what you need for survival um, versus um, turning pine trees into lumber for the mass market. Those two kinds of use are, are put together and made the same in the way that Thoreau talks about them such that Indians and hunters are effectively being held responsible for destruction at a scale that's actually characteristic of extractive capitalism, right? Larger systemic use. In the second passage, we get a taste of the way in which 19th century romantic thought countered older utilitarian attitudes by articulating a spiritual value for untouched wild nature. In my book Against Sustainability, I explore the commonalities between these two seemingly very different ways of valuing non-human nature um, and their mutual relationship with a larger market economy and settler colonialism. Um, so I'm not gonna kind of walk out that particular argument again here. Instead, I wanna notice the way that Thoreau's transgressive sympathy for the pine trees, his ability to imagine the pine as a full member of an interspecies community of the living, sits almost literally alongside the most conventionally savagest take on indigenous people. Rather than mere coincidence, we might see relation here. Thoreau's sense of his own kinship with non-human life as some, is something that is predicated on a form of fantasy indigeneity that requires the disappearance of actual indigenous people. 
Thoreau's biographical tendency to play Indian in Philip Deloria's sense of pretending to be indigenous um, has been well established by scholars. And the Maine Woods passage that I quoted is one of many where he asserts indigenous extermination as something that has already been accomplished and makes claims about the essential difference of indigenous people from whites. Some scholars have tried to um, redeem or explain statements like these by arguing that there's a quality of respect evident in Thoreau's deep interest in indigenous cultures, um, documented most fully in um, this set of notebooks that scholars have come to call his Indian notebooks. What I see is closer to a kind of intellectual appropriation that contemporary indigenous scholars such as Kyle Powys White have demonstrated is not at all outside the dynamics of settler colonialism. Unlike Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau's mentor, who publicly condemned the dispossession and forced removal of the Cherokee, so he wrote open letters to the president and so on, Thoreau's articulated regret is that he has not been able to more fully absorb the knowledges of indigenous peoples before they, quote, disappeared. This is a passage from his journal um, written around the same time that the essay I started with was published, 1858, both of them. How much more me might have learned from the Aborigines if they had not been so reserved? Suppose they had generally become the laboring class among the whites, that my father had been a farmer and had had an Indian for his hired man. How many Aboriginal ways we children should have learned from them? Thoreau's desire to learn the quote unquote Aboriginal ways is part of a project of trying to become indigenous to place as Thoreau scholars, including John Kusich have argued. But unlike these scholars, I don't think Thoreau succeeds. And I think it's important to read him like this, as grasping at something, as chasing something, even feeling the loss of something that is out, that is just out of his reach. Thoreau himself certainly and repeatedly registers the lived realities of settler colonialism in New England. For, for example, in a journal entry from July of 1850, Thoreau pins a fantasy of native disappearance so he rewrites it multiple times in the same entry as if he's kind of like trying to get um, the most affecting literary description of it that culminates in a botanical metaphor. A lone Indian woman without children, accompanied by her dog, weaving the shroud of her race, performing the last services for her departed race, not yet absorbed into the elements again, a daughter of the soil, one of the nobility of the land, the white man and imported weed, burdock and mulline, which displaced the ground nut. In describing the Indian woman without children and her departed race as the overrun native ground nut, Thoreau is somewhat self-conscious about the violence of the displacement he describes, even as he naturalizes it and reduces agency through the passive verb displaced and the term imported weed, right? So who has imported this weed, if not the whites themselves, who are also the weeds being described his choice of burdock and moline, both plants with medicinal uses, and in the case of burdock, a root that can be eaten as food, is also interesting. Both plants have been widely introduced around the globe through settler colonial and imperialist activities and economies. Um, burdock isn't even a native of Europe, but of Japan. The cumulative effect of the botanical metaphorics is to make cultural displacement seem ecological, the out competition of one edible native plant by other introduced varieties. At the end of his first book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, Thoreau calls for us all to become naturalized in place. Man with a capital N, he, M, he tells us, quote, needs not only to be spiritualized, but naturalized on the soul of the earth, he writes. In Thoreau's vision, this naturalized state is a transcendentalist aspiration for an impossible unity between man and his environment. The winds should be his breath, the seasons his moods, and he should impart of his serenity to nature herself, he writes. The impossible aggrandizing identity between nature and the human subject here is something I ask you to file because it stands in direct contrast to the decolonized mode of naturalized dwelling that I'm gonna talk about in part three of this talk. For now, I want us to consider that romantic though it sounds, there's something almost toxic about a non-human world that is indistinguishable from human mental or spiritual life. Mark Rifkin in his book, Settler Common Sense, sees what he calls a phenomenology of settlement visible in Thoreau's relationship with nature and Walden. Rifkin identifies an erasure 
of indigenous sovereignties that provides the inframing condition of possibility for the sense of settler escape into the wilderness. A phenomenology of settlement is as good a name for any as what I'm trying to put my finger on here, especially if we broaden it out beyond Thoreau's conceptions of wilderness. To read Thoreau in this way would be to notice that the exhortation at the end of a week that we become naturalized culminates in another botanical meditation, this one on the meaning and brevity of life, a meditation that is shot through with the language and consciousness, even lived experience of settlement. Um, and so this poem I'm about to talk about is especially interesting. It's the only thing that Thoreau published multiple times in his own lifetime. It was read at his funeral. Um, so it kind of like holds a special place in his, um, in his career. Okay. This passage, which culminates in the poem, begins with an energetic vision of an ideal life spent exploring the natural world around us more vigorously than Columbus, of cannily waiting to buy and settle the richest land before, give, before giving way to a more melancholy, seemingly autobiographical poem that repeatedly emphasized the rootlessness of the speaker who's been transported from their original context to a vase, blooming, consuming, but without root in the land or a generative future. So here's the passage. It is easier to discover another such a new world as Columbus did than to go within one fold of this which we, which we appear to know so well. Let us wait a little and not purchase any clearing here, trusting that richer bottoms will soon be put up. It is but thin soil where we stand. I have felt my roots in a richer air this. I have seen a bunch of violets in a glass vase tied loosely with a straw, which reminded me of myself. <coughs> A bunch of violets without their roots and sorrel intermixed, encircled by a wisp of straw, once coiled about their shoots, the law by which I'm fixed. And here I bloom for a short hour unseen, drinking my juices up, with no root in the land to keep my branches green, but stand in a bare cup. What is this description of naturalized life if not a description of something like the lived experience of dwelling within a privatizing, rootless, alienating settler colonial culture. If here it sounds like a passionate lament, a creed occur, we should not forget that passage from the main woods with which I began, the one where the spectacle of native extermination reminded Thoreau that our life should be lived as tenderly and daintily as one would pluck a flower. If in some places it's an ambivalent lament, in others it's a vaunted ideal. When the language of settlement is noticed at all in Thoreau's work, and it's ignored by readers and um, scholars surprisingly often, there's a strong desire to dismiss it as a mere surface level pattern of diction. Um, so this line of reasoning goes, uh, Thoreau is playing with the language of settler colonialism. He doesn't really mean it. He's just using this kind of um, culturally current vocabulary in the same way that he plays with the language of manifest destiny, for example, in his famous essay, Walking. Um, but again, he, he doesn't really mean it. He's not endorsing manifest destiny. He's not um, endorsing these like metaphorics that he employs. My interest here is less in drawing attention to something like Thoreau's failings or whatever, um, and more in highlighting the critical tendency itself, one might even say a critical investment, in dismissing Thoreau's words as accidental or mere language play. Rather, I want to suggest that our inability to see this side of Thoreau accurately, the one that insistently imagines the disappearance of Native peoples in order to fabricate himself as Concord's Native son, is a reflection of readerly desire to displace the violence of settler colonialism into some earlier period or some elsewhere beyond Concord, to treat settler colonialism as an event already accomplished long before Thoreau was alive and writing, um, rather than a structure that Thoreau, like us, inhabits. To allow Thoreau to mean what he says, on the other hand, is to notice how many of his meditations on mortality, on destiny, on nature, on living a meaningful life, the big topics, in other words, are bound up with an experience of living within settler colonialism, something that many of us still don't quite seem to figure out how to face. An argument, perhaps, for reading and teaching Thoreau in precisely this way, attending to the register of settler colonialism in his work as an integral fabric 
in many of his writings, something he both recognizes and does not, something consciousness defining that places um, limits on his famously transgressive sympathies. A scribe of the world in which we continue to live, in other words, who might help us, his readers, to greater understanding of the structural violence we continue to live within and perpetuate. Okay, part two, Willa Cather, as if she were a sheaf of wheat. If Thoreau's deep dwelling in place remains tied in intimate ways to the disappearance of indigenous peoples, Willa Cather, writing half a century later, crafts a world in which they seem never to have existed at all. In O Pioneers, published in 1913, but set 30 years earlier in the 1880s, Cather depicts several generations of European immigrants steadily transforming a harsh, empty landscape into a blooming farming community. The opening chapter of this novel emphasizes the harshness of the natural environment, the howling wind, the cold, the tough prairie sod, the rough human dwellings barely holding on, trying not to be blown away. This is, quote, stern frozen country, where, quote, the great fact was the land itself, which seemed to overwhelm the little beginnings of human society that struggled in its somber wastes. Cather tells us that this is a, quote, new country, one where, quote, the record of the plow was insignificant, like the feeble scratches on stone left by prehistoric races, so indeterminate that they may, after all, be only the markings of glaciers and not a record of human strivings. At the opening of novel, in the midst of this waste, Norwegian immigrant John Bergstrom is dying. Just a failed farmer, he's discouraged that he had, quote, made but little impression upon the wild land he had come to tame. After instructing his sons to, quote, try to break a little more land every year, Bergstrom leaves his eldest daughter, his eldest child, a daughter, Alexandra, in charge of the management of their unprofitable farm. For Bergstrom, the land has been, quote, a horse that no one knows how to break to harness, that runs wild and kicks things to pieces, unquote. But under Alexandra's careful management, the farm slowly transforms. It is Alexandra's love for the land, as much as her business sense, that Cather credits with the change. On a surveying expedition with her younger brother, Emil, the boy notices with wonder that Alexandra is beaming. Cather writes, her face was so radiant that he felt shy about asking her why she looked so happy. For the first time, perhaps, since that land emerged from the waters of geologic ages, a human face was set toward it with love and yearning. It seemed beautiful to her, rich and strong and glorious. Her eyes drank in the breath of it until her tears blinded her. Then the genius of the divide, the great free spirit which breathes across it, must have bent lower than it ever bent to a human before. The history of a country begins in the heart of a man or a woman. Catherine makes several romantic, I mean, like the prose here is beautiful as it is in so many parts of this novel. Um, she makes several romantic, but kind of hard to swallow claims, right? Um, that Alexandra is likely the quote, first human face in the history of this landscape to love and yearn from it. That the great free spirit of the land like bends or kneels before her as a result of this love. And that um, the quote, history of this landscape begins in this moment in the heart of Alexandra, who can see how beautiful, how rich and strong the land is. Where her father failed before her, Alexandra succeeds. By loving this wild land, which she buys up in large quantities, right, thanks to the Homestead Act, she tames and breaks it, participates in its transformation into productive private property. So successful is she that a mere 16 years after her father's death, Quote, the shaggy coat of the prairie, which they lifted to make him a bed, has vanished forever. And the country is now a vast checkerboard, marked off in squares of wheat and corn, light and dark, dark and light. Telephone wires hum along the white roads, which always run at right angles. The divide is now thickly populated. The rich soil yields heavy harvests. The dry, bracing climate and the smoothness of the land make labor easy for men and beasts. The brown earth yields itself eagerly to the plow, rolls away from the shear, not even dimming the brightness of the metal with a deep, soft sigh of happiness. 
Within the context of Cather's novel, this transformation is meant to be indubitably positive, even utopian. Private property, the organization of the formerly wild, ungovernable prairie into tidy, marked off squares, easy labor, and land that yields itself eagerly to the plow, um, with a deep, soft sigh of happiness even, um, this is Eden all over again, a pre-Lapsarian agricultural fantasy, an, inherit an inheritor of the supposedly sustainable agrarian ideal that Abby Good so lucidly outlines and appraises in her brilliant book, Agritopias. As I've already shown, Cather suggests that all of this wealth and development loosely began in the heart of Alexandra with her love and yearning for the prairie landscape. This love and yearning translates into a steady program of land acquisition, as Alexandra, somewhat against her brother's wishes, buys more and more and more land, slowly becoming a large landowner and making all the Bergstrom family quite rich once the land is tamed into these neat monocropped wheat and corn commodity farming squares. Alexandra's very being is so deeply linked to the land's productivity that she lacks, quote, a personality apart from the soil. It is in the soil that Alexandra expresses herself best, readers are told. And indeed, the soil expresses itself in her also. Alexandra was peculiarly happy when she was close to the fat, fallow world about her and felt, as it were, in her own body, the joyous germination in the soil. This is surely a deep, close embrace of a landscape, even identification with it. It is, from certain perspectives, a portrait of immigrants becoming naturalized to place, loving and linking with it. But setting aside the lush prose and appealing romanticism of Cather's portrait of Alexandra Bergstrom and her world, is this the best version of loving and dwelling, the one we would do well to emulate now? From our vantage point, we can see the environmental cost of eradicating the prairie ecosystem with its wild grasses and their remarkable root systems, some up to 14 feet deep, beneficial for storing carbon, preventing erosion, nourishing soil, generally supporting life. It's also easy enough to see effects of the novel's repeated insistence that this is an empty, wild, new country, as if its previous indigenous inhabitants haven't been forcibly removed, and relatively recently at that. But even in terms of Alexandra herself, what is the nature of her connection really, fostered as it is by this acquisitive, profit-based commodity relation to the land? Two moments in the novel spring to mind for me here in trying to answer this question. And they're both lovely and weird. In the first, the omniscient narrator is describing Alexandra's most secret fantasy, the one that recurs when she's alone and exhausted. Here it is. Sometimes as she lay thus luxuriously idle, her eyes closed, she used to have an illusion of being lifted up bodily and carried lightly by someone very strong. It was a man certainly who carried her, but he was like no man that she knew. He was much larger and stronger and swifter, and he carried her as easily as if she were a sheaf of wheat. She never saw him, but with eyes closed, she could feel that he was yellow like the sunlight, and there was the smell of ripe cornfields about him. So on the one hand, this is clearly a vision of this strong, sturdy, capable Alexandra being cared for by, as she kind of never is throughout the novel, um, by a man who is impossibly, the novel implies, um, even more capable and even more physically robust than she is. To be cared in this, in this way would be to rest, to put her proverbial burdens down. And yet, there's something deeply weird about the last two sentences where the fantasy turns Alexandra into a commodity crop and her imaginary lover into what? The environment in which the crop rose, grows, the human that harvests her, it, all of the above. The sheaf of wheat fantasy is unfulfillable, but the last line of the book offers a more realistic mode of becoming crop. As Alexandra and her husband-to-be, an artistic, more physically frail man who could certainly not carry her like a sheaf of wheat, walk off into the sunset their romance in Alexander's life and the novel itself culminates in a vision of compost. Fortunate country that is one day to receive hearts like Alexandra's into its bosom, to give them out again in yellow wheat, in the rustling corn, in the shining eyes of youth. 
In Against Sustainability, I discuss how Walt Whitman's poetics rely on compost specifically and material recycling more generally to prop up a vision of an inexhaustible and unpollutable earth. Cather, whose title, O Pioneers, is specifically taken from a Whitman poem, is clearly doing something similar here with the figure of compost. The development that Alexandra has begun, it's implied, can continue on into the future indefinitely because it will be fed by bodies like hers and her father's before her. The corn, the shining eyes of youth, are endlessly renewable resources as long as hearts like Alexandra's are buried in the prairie's bosom. Is this a positive ecological vision of dwelling in place? Even apart from what we know about the fictiveness of much recycling, the inability of compost to manage problems with industrial agriculture, is becoming part of the agricultural economy by nourishing a commodity crop after we're dead really the best form of connection we can hope for? Is this joining the natural cycle or an economic one or some blend of the two? Most readers of O Pioneers would agree that Alexander's love does not feed the, lad, the land that she loves in a reciprocal relation. Her emotional attachment is more of a sort of feel good cover slapped on what we can recognize at this late date as a kind of unidirectional extractivist relationship, right? So she's taking from the land much more than she's giving back just by virtue of the scale of the farming. But finally, if we're comfortable recognizing the elements of capitalism and settler colonialism that are intermixed in Cather's loving and attentive literary portrait of becoming naturalized to a place, and many scholars are willing to do so, right? So part of what interests me is that um, people who read O Pioneers are totally willing to talk about and address the settler colonialism in a way that people who read some of the same pieces of Thoreau that I was bringing up um, are unwilling to do. So if we're so comfortable um, recognizing this in Cather, why are we so much less comfortable recognizing some of these same qualities in Thoreau's writing, despite the fact that he himself seems more attentive to these economic and historical realities than Cather? Part three, Kimmer, deep reciprocity that renews the world. So during this last part of my talk, I want to turn to Robin Wall Kimmer's collection of essays, Braiding Sweetgrass, for a different model of becoming naturalized to a place, um, something apart from or other than what we get in either Thoreau or Cather. Kimmer writes Braiding Sweetgrass from the unique intersection of her identities as an indigenous woman, a scientist, and a literary storyteller. Braiding Sweetgrass is a, is a diverse and remarkable set of essays. So I teach this at least once a year, every year. Um, and it's consistently my students' favorite book. Uh, if you haven't read it, go forth and get a copy. It will blow your mind. Um, it's hard to sum up because it's a series of essays. Um, but one thing I could offer is that Kimmer, uh, a Potawatomi botanist, demonstrates the disjunctures between Anglo-American and indigenous American cultures in order to de detail aspects of the indigenous worldview in which the earth exists not as private property, but as a commons to be tended with respect and reciprocity for the benefit of all. Although she uses universalizing language at times, inclusively promising that, quote, we can reclaim our membership in the cultures of gratitudes that formed our old relationship with the living earth, she is nevertheless careful to note that being indigenous is not simply a mantle that those in settler society can slip on. Like my elders before me, I want to envision a way that an immigrant society could become indigenous to place, but I'm stumbling on the words. Immigrants cannot by definition be indigenous. Indigenous is a birthright word. No amount of time or caring changes history or substitutes for soul deep fusion with the land. But if people do not feel indigenous, can they nevertheless enter into the deep reciprocity that renews the world? Is this something that can be learned? I see Thoreau in his own way as asking similar questions to these. Kimmerer's answer is yes, with a caveat that what she calls second man cannot simply become first man though he can nevertheless live a life of ethical relation. Like Thoreau, Kimmerer also chooses the term naturalized for the form of deep reciprocity available to those in settler cultures. Sliding back and forth between botanical and political registers, Kimmerer explains her concept through a contrast between the behavior of invasive colonizing plants and her example of a naturalized 
plant plantain, otherwise called white man's footstep. Foreign invaders like loose strife, kudzu, and cheatgrass have the colonizing habit of taking over others' homes without regard to limits. But plantain is not like that. Its strategy was to be useful, to fit into small places, to coexist with others around the dooryard, to heal wounds. Plantain is not indigenous, but naturalized. This is the same word we use for the foreign born when they become citizens in our country. They pledge to uphold the laws of the state. They might well uphold Nanabozo's original instructions too. Unlike Thoreau's rootless plucked violets, which are isolated from their environment, or Cather's commodity crops, which displace native plants, or kudzu, which overwhelms them, Kimmerer wants non-Indigenous readers to learn to live like plantain, to root themselves in places where they can be useful, coexisting or even cooperating with others who share their dwelling. In Kimmerer's account, to become thus naturalized is to live with gratitude, respect, and accountability to a place and its beings. It's not just an attitude or a state of mind. Being naturalized involves real acts of care, self-sacrifice, asking permission, accountability, and so on. Kimmerer writes in the 21st century, fully alive to our moment of danger, as Julie C. has called it. And yet she continually works to keep us in touch with the ways in which the living world remains present all around us, available for relationships of care. In Braiding Sweetgrass, she acknowledges the grief many of us may feel for what human beings have done and continue to do for, to our planet, but she ur urges her readers that it is not enough to weep for our lost landscapes. We have to put our hands in the earth to make ourselves whole again. Even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily and I must return the gift. Kimmer refuses despair or eco grief, perhaps in part because grief and despair suggest an end to a relationship, like the earth has died, right? So we're grieving it. But our relationship with the earth has not ended. In fact, it must be insisted upon, nurtured, strengthened, and prioritized now more than ever. We need to deepen our relationship with the living world, not mourn its loss. We need to embrace performing the care that the world needs and to become ever more conscious of and grateful for the care and joy we daily receive in return, the feeding, holding, and wonder Kimmer invites us to ground ourselves in. Unlike an isolating, potentially anthropocentric dwelling in loss, this is a relational orientation that responds to the ongoing liveliness of the world, its presence, its needs in the present, which most of us are not doing as much as we could to honor or to meet. To move toward this kind of relationship, Kimmer suggests, for one thing, acting to repair harm humans have done the more than human world. Like other mindful practices, ecological restoration can be viewed as an act of reciprocity in which humans exercise their caregiving responsibilities for the ecosystems that sustain us, Kimura writes. We restore the land and the land restores us. Restoration is a powerful antidote to despair. Restoration offers concrete means by which humans can once again enter into positive, creative relationship with the more than human world, meeting responsibilities that are simultaneously material and spiritual. It's not enough to grieve. It's not enough to just stop doing bad things. <laughs> to, to commit to reparative action rather than grief or apocalyptic despair is to refuse to reify the present, to reject the message we seem to receive from all sides the status quo is unchangeable. As Ralph Waldo Emerson urges in his famous essay, Circles, we need not, quote, accept the actual for the necessary. The killing status quo of consumer capitalism in the US and everything that flows from it need not be inevitable. With or without hope, either way, we can commit ourselves to the virtuous action and relationships of reciprocal care and repair in the places where we live with the beings we live with. Throughout Breeding Sweetgrass, Kimmerer reflects on how her training as a scientist at time complements and at times conflicts with the indigenous wisdom that guides her. Nowhere is the conflict more evident than when she speaks of love, and she speaks of love often in this book. 
Not just her love for the more than human world, which we might expect, but also her conviction that that world loves her back. In the essay, Epiphany in the Beans, her epiphany is just this, that she actively loves her garden and her garden actively loves her back. I jumped ahead, but that's okay. I spend a lot of time thinking about our relationships with the land, how we are given so much and what we might give back. I try to work through the equations of reciprocity and responsibility, the whys and wherefores of building sustainable relationships with the ecosystems, all in my head. But suddenly there was no intellectualizing, no rationalizing, just the pure sensation of baskets full of mother love, the ultimate reciprocity, loving and being loved. We're exhorted to love mother earth all the time, but accept that the earth loves us back that is an unfamiliar, maybe even uncomfortable idea for most of us. What could such love look like? For Kimmerer, the love that the land has for her and for all of us is articulated not through words and it's not simply a feeling one has. Instead, she describes the love as inhering in a series of capacities and behaviors most of us would be able to recognize and acknowledge having experienced. Things like nurturing health and well-being, generous sharing of resources, interdependence, and the creation of beauty. Why does this matter? According to Kimmerer, knowing that you love the earth changes you, activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. The relationship piece, the sacred bond, is a central part of what Kimmerer suggests settler culture, or what she calls second man, is missing. We don't live as if this is the land that feeds us, as if these are the streams from which we drink, that build our bodies and fill our spirits. We have not been taught to say to ourselves, here is where I will give my gifts and meet my responsibilities. The novelist John Williams describes love as, quote, not an end, but a process through which one person attempts to know another. Kimmerer, in broadening the term person to include all the beings who inhabit the biosphere, challenges us to enact this process of knowing throughout our richly inhabited world of birch people, bear people, rock people, beings we think of and speak of and live with as persons worthy of our respect, and indeed, in the sense that she is describing, of our love. What this means is that, quote, we need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but also for our relationship to the world, as Kimura writes. Such a restoration of relationship centers active love, interconnection, and mutual aid, rather than grief or helplessness or despair. We are deluged by information regarding our destruction of the world and hear almost nothing about how to nurture it, Kimmerer complains. It is no surprise, then, that environmentalism becomes synonymous with dire predictions and powerless feelings. Our natural inclination to do right by the world is stifled, breeding despair when it should be inspiring action. The participatory role of people in the well being of the land has been lost. Our reciprocal relations reduced to a keep out sign. As Kathleen Dean Moore writes in The Pine Island Paradox, quote, to love a place is to care for it, to keep it healthy, and to attend to its needs as if they were my own, because they are my own. Responsibility grows from love, it is the natural shape of my caring. Rather than giving up or even seeking to leave no trace, we need to accept our role in an ongoing relationship with the earth, to behave like the caring gardeners who, together with the land, can help bring into being what the poet Lucille Clifton describes as a new flowering. Let there be new flowering in the fields, let the fields turn mellow for the men, let the men tender through the time, let the time be rested from the war, let the war be won, let love be at the end. Active and activist love rather than grief commits us to a relationship. Clifton, like Kimmerer, points the way toward committing ourselves to a relationship with the biotic community where we live. Dwelling responsibly, learning the names of the beings who surround us, caring for and being cared for by them in return, restoring and being restored while remaining aware of our context, the indigenous or naturalized, 
How can we transform the systems that negatively limit our relationships in our lives? It is deepening the mutuality of our relationships that will keep us tender, that will push us to restore, that will enable the new flowering, that will keep us working to return the gift. Okay. I wanna conclude with a few words, short words, I promise, about an astonishing W.S. Merwin poem that I've been thinking about a lot lately. The poem is called Unchopping a Tree, and it's a quiet Jeremiah against the thoughtlessness of environmental destruction. In this poem, Merwin asks readers to commit to repair of the non-human world, even as he invokes the awful, even insurmountable scale of the reparative work before us. Merwin's prose poem is written in paragraph form and it adopts the familiar didactic tone of a mid 20th century instruction manual for DIY work. So it's like a series of instructions that make it sound like any idiot can do this, right? Despite the fact that unchopping a tree is a logical impossibility, the step-by-step -step imperatives of the instructions insist that we perform the necessary actions. So it begins, start with the leaves, the small twigs, the nests that have been shaken, ripped, or broken by the fall. These must be gathered and attached once again to their respective places. This first instruction, mm -hmm daunting but possibly achievable, is built upon paragraph by paragraph in dizzying detail. Bees and wasp nests that occupied the hollows of the tree must be rebuilt. Spider's webs must be rewoven and replaced, even though, quote, we do not have the spider's weaving equipment, nor any substitute for the leaf's living bond with a point of its point of attachment and nourish nourishment. It is even harder to stimulate, simulate the latter when the leaves have once become dry, as they are bound to do for this is not the labor of the moment. Also, it hardly needs saying that this is the time to repair any neighboring trees or bushes or other growth that may have been damaged by the fall. The same rules apply. Where neighboring trees were of the same species, it is difficult not to waste time conveying a detached leaf back to the wrong tree. Practice, practice, put your hope in that. It is hard, we do not have, such instructions emphasize the difficulty of the tax, tasks and the inadequacy of the human beings who must do them. As the paragraphs pile up, as the paragraphs of steps and tasks pile up, the painful impossibility of following the instructions for unchopping a tree oppresses the reader. The original chopping, chopping of the tree becomes increasingly sickening as the poem draws attention to the myriad miraculous details of the ordinary and anonymous tree that must now be repaired. The tree's leaves, branches, trunks, joints, chips, sawdust, and so on can only be reassembled in the crudest possible manner through the unstinting labor of many years. And all of it, if it could even be done, would still only leave you with a skeleton standing where a living tree once was. The poem ends on a note of fear. The tree has been unchopped, but you cannot believe it will hold. How like something dreamed it is, standing there all by itself. You are afraid of the motion of the, the motion of the clouds will be enough to push it over. What more can you do? What more can you do? But there's nothing more you can do. Others are waiting. Everything is going to have to be put back. Throughout the step-by-step -step instructions for unchopping a tree, the speaker insists that the work of repair must be done even if it is overwhelming, and even though it is wholly inadequate to undo the destruction that necessitated it. The impossibility of unchopping even a single tree turns the entire living world into something unspeakably precious and beyond human skill to manufacture or repl replicate. The poem is thus a fierce attack on the vision of cheap disposable nature that has driven several centuries of capitalist activity and expansion. It is also a strange call to action on behalf, behalf of the wounded world. Kimmerer asks us not to grieve, but to take responsibility for restoring. Merwin's final line, everything is going to have to be put back, could be read as a threat. To imagine putting everything back could be to imagine some final apocalyptic end to our current world order. Or it could be an expansion, a circumscription and transcendence, the bringing into being of other better worlds. The power of Merwin's poem lies in its ability to convey how taking responsibility for restoration is also a path to increased wonder for the non-human world. 
As the reader contemplates the repair of each detail of the chopped tree, it becomes clear that this ordinary tree, and therefore every tree and every living being, is a miracle, a quote, work of ecstasy, as Ralph Waldo Emerson has written. Writers who bring us into this experience of ecstasy, as Kimmerer, Merwin, Clifton, Thoreau, Cather, and others variously do, are creating literature of the kind that Emerson calls for in his essay Circles, literature that, quote, affords us a platform whence we may command a view of our present life, a purchase by which we may move it. Moving our present life, transforming it radically, transcending its status quo in the way that Emerson celebrates in circles is not something we can afford to cynically reject as impossible. If the mood of grief encourages us to do so, we must ignore it and commit to repair of the world in the spirit of Emerson's claim that, quote, everything is impossible until we see a success. The literary scholar Dominic Mastriani, writing of moods and the secret cause of revolution in Emerson, observes that for Emerson, changing our mood, our, our perspective, our zeitgeist, indeed all forms of radical change are not fully within our control. The task of the citizen is to unleash a revolutionary force capable of destroying an existing world and contribute constituting a new one. Yet such force cannot be summoned at will. But by doing things we know how to do, Emerson suggests, we can hope to create conditions that favor its coming. Restoration, repair, relations of interconnection, and mutual care, these are things we know how to do, even if they are also, or would also be in our current mood, something of a miracle. But we are called upon to make that miracle, to once again enter into positive, creative relationship with a more than human world, meeting responsibilities that are simultaneously material and spiritual, as Kimmerer tells us. Do not craze yourself with thinking, Emerson advises in another essay, experience, but go about your business anywhere, including here in the disaster of the Anthropocene. Thanks. I'm just wondering, like thinking back to like, the point about like loving the earth, I guess, like do you think it's possible for us to truly love the earth when our culture is so centered around technology? And the technology we have is like through the exploitation and also like with a deep history of colonization since it essentially enabled it. Such a good question. Um, part of what interests me in Braiding Sweetgrass is that she's, um, she's sort of talking about what it would be to start taking steps away from the culture that you're very accurately describing. Um, and she can kind of make it seem deceptively simple, right? Like start learning the names, like, like address your plant blindness, right? Start learning the names of like the beings that neighbor you, plant, animal. Um, um, she, she has this sort of series of get involved in like acts of restoration. What are the, you know, um, environmental problems, where you actually live, um, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think my sense of it is that the more that you take steps like that, and there are others, um, the more that you start developing um, an organic relationship with the place that you live. The other problem though, is like how many of us actually root ourselves in a, in a single place, right? I'm, I'm an academic, we're sort of like, we just go where the wind blows us kind of thing, right? Um, our culture more generally, like how many people sort of say, I was born here and I'm gonna like live here and I'm gonna die here. My family is five generations deep in this place. Like, like that would, that happens occasionally but it's remarkable when it does, right? So I, I think there are just, you're right. There are so many kind of like forces. And so this is exactly, I feel like sometimes there are things you're intellectually interested in. And then there, there's always like a, an, a subterranean like personal interest that you, that you have. And this is kind of the personal interest that I have is like, what is it? I'm from California. I now live in, in New England. Like, what is it to sort of root myself in a place that I'm not from? Um, what does that look like? And um, how do you overcome like all of the obstacles that you're describing? Um, I mean, I think braiding sweetgrass is a great place to start if you're curious about this because she has a lot to say. And an excellent audio book. Oh, she reads it. She reads it's it. Amazing. Yeah, it, it's the. Best way to experience, I think. If I'm, I swear I'm not getting a commission, but it's um, <laughs> currently included uh, for free if you have an Audible membership. And my students have told me that it's also the recording is available on um, the whole thing on YouTube. It is a terrific audiobook. 
So we have two, a two part question. I guess it's really two questions in one chat. One is, can you give a definition of settler colonialism? And then two, <laughs> they're like not small questions, but I'm gonna give you both of them. And then two, can you talk a little bit about the title of your book against sustainability? Sure. I mean, okay. So when I'm talking about settler colonialism, I'm sort of working within the genre that um, thinks about settler colonialism as a structure, not a single event, right? So it's not like just some ships of people came and they showed up and they like landed and then they lived there and they stayed. Um, it's like an ongoing event that is still unfolding, um, that that or an ongoing structure that is still unfolding that we all sort of like live within, right? In ways that we both acknowledge and don't, right? Um, so for me, for instance, as an American, when I lived in Canada and they were going through their kind of process of, um, of kind of, uh, it was a nationwide sort of um, process of acknowledging um, the sort of historical harm that Canada had done to First Nations. There were like, you know, it was like a year long national program. All the universities were involved. All the schools were involved. The government was talking about it. I mean, it just struck me like we never had something like that in the United States, right? Um, and we sort of think and talk about it, I think less than um, many of the other um, then certainly than Australia and Canada, right? Which would seem to be the kind of analogous um, um, settler colonial cultures talk about it. Um, okay, why against sustainability? Um, I often wonder if I should have called the book that. <laughs> um, but um, but so what, what I was sort of talking about or trying to think about is the way that um, some of our most cherished environmental ethics. So in one chapter, I'm talking about recycling. Um, in another chapter, I'm talking about preservation. Um, I was looking at how these like really cherished environmental ethics have their origin in the 19th century and how, um, as I kind of looked at them and thought about them deeply, it felt like the logic of these was um, contributing to the ongoing nature of the problem that they were apparently addressing, right? So if you think about recycling um, and it's trying to address the problem of overconsumption, um, but when you actually look at recycling, um, it feels in the end as if it's actually contributing to this experience that we have that we can consume without limits, right? Because oh, it'll just be recycled. Um, and so I look at kind of the origin of this linking of recycling and consumption in the in 19th century literature and culture. Um, so, so I was sort of looking at, at these familiar environmental ethics that I was arguing kind of have problems. And then I was looking at these counter ethics. Um, so instead of recycling, joyful frugality, right? Um, the idea that actually like not consuming produces happiness. Um, and Thoreau and Emily Dickinson are like my figures in that chapter who think about that. Like that, that the real moment of happiness is actually like before you acquire the thing that you want um, and that the fulfillment of desire actually isn't the experience of happiness, right? It's like that, that moment of anticipation. And what if you could dilate that moment? Um, Dickinson is really thinking about that. So, so in the end, by the end of the book, I was kind of saying, um, I think that what we need in kind of Anglo-American culture, um, settler culture in the US is a, um, our more transformative environmental ethics, right? We don't need to sustain the same old stuff we've been doing. Um, we need to sort of commit to transformation, right? Because we're actually out of time. So maybe sustainability like 40 years ago, but, um, but not in 2024. Other other questions here? Yeah. Um, so it's sort of struck in chronologically, like we put it out right gathered to um, do you feel like that kind of moving towards a newer or a different idea just in naturalization is chronological, or did that just kind of happen in these examples? Like are there pretty thorough examples of the same ideas that came with the Yeah, what a good question. Um, I would say that I think. That question feels complicated because I, I think it's the what Kimmerer brings and what indigenous philosophers and writers um, that I'm interested in bring um, is a is a is a kind of reflection on um, from the outside on so many aspects of kind of settler culture that from within it can be hard to maybe see. Um, or at least to sort of see as accurately as someone um, with critical distance can see them. Um, and so the, the problem, so, so yes, 
yes, in earlier periods, but we don't, of course, for all kinds of reasons, have as much, um, have as many of those like perspectives from the earlier periods in an unmediated way, like who wrote down the thing and so on um, in those earlier periods. So, I mean, that's such a great question and um, something there was, I, I'm not really trying to sort of trace and move forward in time so much as um, just kind of think about environmental writers and the way that, um, and, and Catherine felt like, like the more familiar, um, but I don't know what would happen if I flipped those examples. Yeah. It's really helpful. Thanks. I mean, I think I think I'm just thinking a lot about place and um, like I said before, like what is it what is it to live responsibly for any of us, you know, whatever our particular identities are, the place we live, all those things, like just like what is how do we even start to think about what it is to live responsibly um, in this moment when we have these larger structural problems that most of us can't do a whole lot to um, intervene in, right? Um, at that sort of like big macro level, right? Like we can, we can, we can organize, we can vote, we can like do the things that we can do. Um, but at a certain place, it starts to feel like we have also the ability to really like embed ourselves in local and, um, you know, state communities and th that those are places where action feel really possible to me, positive action. Um, and so then like, what does it look like, right? Like, what does it look like to live responsibly in the places where we actually live? Um, and yeah, just wanting to think about that and thinking about what some figures that are very interesting to me. In some ways, like place is the oldest thing in environmental literature. Like when people first started thinking about environmental literature, they were really, really interested in like what all these writers had to say about place and how they talked about place, how they thought about place. Um, and so I'm kind of interested in turning back to that interest, although maybe with a slightly different lens. Um, thank you for this great talk. Uh, really inspiring. I think a lot of students, because my students would agree that things like joy are definitely very necessary in a moment like this. Um, I wanted to ask you about romanticism. Mm. Because you mentioned a lush romantic post pather obviously the romanticism of Thoreau, and there's something about how that seems to be a key feature of yeah, the colonial that, that you're pulling out, that romanticism seems to accompany the erasure of, or the kind of um, uh, assumption of extinction um, of indigenous peoples. What is it that you see in Merwin or Kimmerer that does something different or offers an alternative to that uh, romanticism? Because I think romanticism is also part of the problem with the preservationism you discuss in the book. Yeah. yeah. I I don't know that I would have put it exactly like this, but I but I guess one thing that I see if we're sort of putting Merwin and I would put Clifton too, um, and Kimmer on this side, and then like Thoreau and Cather on this side. It's not that. I don't know. Actually, I'm not sure why I would put Thoreau in relation to this, but th there's there in some of this kind of literature that that writes deeply and attempts to really like represent a place deeply. Um, and I think this is true of like environmental literature in the 20th century. Also, there's sometimes this feeling that like the art itself, the literature itself, is a is a kind of like vehicle of preservation or even like substitution um, for actual, like for having an actual relationship to the material plate or in an ongoing way, right? Um, like so many of these are like, I, I, I don't know, for some reason, I don't wanna pick on this book, but I'm thinking of like um, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek or like so many of the, the, the kind of 20th century things that I can think about um, that have this structure following Thoreau of like, I went and I lived in this place for a little while. Here's some beautiful things I noticed. Um, and and then I left and wrote about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I I think there's an insistence in Clifton and in um, Merwin and in Kimmerer that you can't just substitute, that you, they can't, you can't actually substitute anything um, for a an ongoing, 
relationship, reciprocal relationship with the living world. Like, like art doesn't do it. Beautiful writing doesn't do it. Um, I mean, Catherine didn't like stay in the prairie, right? <laughs> like she couldn't wait to get out of there. So I don't know. But it seems to me that um, perhaps what you're describing is that you have to be corporal. You have to be, um, your body has to be present in place, breathe the air. And this is what Pure invited us to yeah. do. And I think when you talk about moving around, I am a daughter of the prairie. And when Willa Cather describes the prairie, especially in my Antonia, yeah, I see it. Yeah. And I and I remember the prairie. Um, and then moving to the Northeast, um, the thing that I felt really compelled to do was how do I belong to this place? And for me, oh, interesting. And um, it's the blueberries. Interesting. Right? It's the, it's what can I can you know bring yeah. the, uh, wintergreen and smell the wintergreen be really yeah physically present. Yeah. In a place. And I think when you think about technology, we are further detached than we've ever been from the natural world. And I think if we were to think about how spiritually and physically we get re-engaged and really belong, because we, we belong. We are a product of the earth. Yeah. To re-belong, we need to get reattached, literally, physically. Yeah. To all the other living things. Like even be conscious of the food we eat. What is it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I just taught braiding sweetgrass actually in a food literature class that I'm teaching this semester. Yeah. Um, but and and I was just in Ohio and the person who picked me up from the airport to give a talk um said, like, oh, Connecticut, blueberries, right? So it's funny that you say that. Um, I mean, Kimmer talks a lot about gardening, right? And the kind of like relationship that it fosters to a place. I think for me, um, I moved here and I felt like panicked that I looked at the world around me and I didn't know the names of any of the plants that I was seeing, right? Which I hadn't even realized that that would, I, I had just always been a Californian, right? So, um, but also birds, like I sort of, there's so many birds. Um, I don't know, I felt like in California where I was from, we had like four kinds of birds, you know what I mean? And like, um, I don't know, funny things like, I, when you're from the West, you grow up with this iconography of winter in which there are always cardinals. I guess people just like cardinals, you know? And I got here and I was like, oh no, it's because in winter there's the red snow, or sorry, the white snow and the red cardinal sitting on, like, do you know what I mean? These things where that sort of like circulate that are, I'm sure you all have these sort of like images of I don't know, aspects of California, right? That um, seem really goofy. They circulate in this sort of free floating way. But like when you live there, you have a sense of, everything that led to the production of that image being um, circulated in relation to that place, right? You have a relationship to the fact of the Cardinal in winter, right? Um, yeah. Right, we here in the Maple Nation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. section of yeah. the country about that map. Yeah, um, we're really selling Brady's secret. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so remarkable, it really is. Is there... Other questions? Why did it go into the neutralization? Kimmer is essentially like neutralization is like in the main not cellular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has also this other like botanical meaning. And I, I think, um, I don't feel like I know the answer for Thoreau yet. Like this is really brand new stuff that I've just begun thinking about. Um, Kimmerer herself, I think is really interested in how that word bridges. She's a she's a botanist, right? So how it kind of bridges these, these different registers that she's trying to bring together. Um, I feel like for Thoreau, he's playing with, um, he's taking the kind of like political register of becoming a naturalized citizen and, um, trying to pull the nature like root out of it and like what is it to live a natural life I think that's kind of what he's doing with it but I really haven't um dug deep into like does this word appear in other places in his work you know what I mean? so I mean I really appreciate that question and have to say I don't yet know the answer <laughs> but it interests me too you know what I mean to think about um especially maybe the way that Kimmerer uses it is sort of inviting those of us in settler culture to put ourselves back into history, right? Um, and to um, 
have a little bit of um, perspective, right? Um, no matter when our families arrived, um, the, you know, if we're not indigenous, we're not indigenous and inviting us to sort of think about that and um, and to live in a way that is really in relation to that history, right? Um, responsibly. I don't think they can like, respect what we know from the Greeks. I mean, they didn't even like the Irish. They were like, what Yeah, Thoreau's kind of nasty about the Irish, <laughs> just to prove your point. But I definitely, definitely, like, my brother's in the community, I would talk about Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you all for your questions and thank you, Michelle, for your time.